Hi, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started. Um, thank you for joining us here at our annual HHS Native American Heritage Month celebration um, here in the Great Hall of Health and Human Services. Um, I also wanted uh, to welcome all of you who are joining us uh, at home or on your, at your desks and joining us by the live stream. Um, my name is Jess Smith. I'm the Acting Director of the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs here at HHS. Um, and before we get started, um, I'm going to invite uh, Chairwoman Cheryl Andrews Maltese up to the stage. Um, she's the Chairwoman of the Wapanag Tribe of Gayhead Aquana. Uh, hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, she's going to join us in an opening prayer before we get started. So thank you. Thank you. If you'll all just pray in your own way. Creator and ancestors, thank you for this day and the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Thank you for all of your sacrifices in order for us to be here today. Thank you for the many gifts of our brothers and sisters who are motion and motionless, animate and inanimate, that live within, above, and beneath the surface of our Mother Earth. Thank you for the bountiful gifts that we've received just recently and our ability to spend time with family and friends and remember all those that have come before us and upon whose shoulders we stand from the paths that they blazed. Thank you for the gathering of all these people with many hearts in a good mind and in a good way to come together to find solutions to our problems that we have and walk together on a pathway forward for the benefit of all of our future generations to come. Oh. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Chairwoman, for those beautiful words. Um, we're gathered here today to celebrate um, the achievements in 2023, advancing our nation-to-nation -nation relationship with tribes. Um, and there's much to celebrate today. Uh, first, if you look around the room, you'll see some of our tribal flags that are uh, presented here in the Great Hall, and we're going to celebrate those in just a moment. Um, first, we'll be hearing about some of the historic uh, activities to secure advanced appropriations for the Indian Health Services. Um, this is no small feat, and uh, for those of you uh, who have experienced, we've now come up against two potential government shutdowns, and the exciting part here is that Indian Health Services would have continued on regardless. Uh, this is a, a huge step forward um, in terms of securing uh, uh, substantial and, uh, and ongoing continuity of activities with our Indian Health Services. Um, we're also going to hear today about some of the accomplish accomplishments we've made in protecting Native families and cultures. And today will be capped, as I just mentioned, with a dedication of our great hall, the new Hall of Tribal Nations, uh, here at Health and Human Services. Um, we will, uh, again, you're, you're already previewing some of the uh, flags that are being uh, flown here in the Great Hall. Um, we'll make sure to span the room for those of you who are joining us by the live stream. Um, I want to thank our staff before we go too far. Uh, here in the room, I want to thank uh, Delvin, uh, <laughs> I want to thank uh, Devin Delro, um, who is our director of our tribal team. Uh, Devin is in the back of the room. A big thanks to Devin for his work, um, both in today's activities and in the, the two days ahead of us with the stack meeting. I also want to thank uh, Lisa Meisner, who's standing at the back of the room as well. Um, these are our two uh, tribal team uh, superstars um, that really keep us fueled and going. There's three other people uh, here in the room that I also want to acknowledge that are no longer with our IEA team who have since joined the Indian Health Services. Stacy Ekafee is sitting at the back of the room. Um, Stacy has been very instrumental, uh, particularly in ensuring that um, we could have our tribal stack flags here uh, to fly. Um, Brittany uh, Cordelette is also sitting in the back of the room, a uh, 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 fellow former member of our IEA team. And I think watching on the live stream is Patty Welch, who is an important member of our team as well. Thank you all. 
Um, at HHS, we are proud of the more than 10,000 full-time non-commissioned core employees of Native American heritage who serve our country day in and day out. They represent nearly 12% of the department's workforce and are essential in fulfilling our mission of enhancing the health and well-being of all Americans. So please uh, join me in acknowledging all of our HHS uh, uh, Native American colleagues from across the department. It's now um, my honor and privilege to share opening remarks for today's festivities with Victor Joseph, the Tribal Chair of the, the Secretary's Tribal Advisory Committee, or our STAC, um, from the, uh, the native village of uh, uh, Tanana in Alaska. STAC was one of the first Tribal Advisory Committees to be established at the Secretary level. So with that, please join us. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's great to be here, especially celebrating not only this month with you, but this day. So as it was said, my name is Victor Joseph. I'm a tribal member from the native village of Tanana. I'm formerly the chief chairman of the Tanana Chiefs Conference, and that was a consortium of 42 tribes in the interior of Alaska. That covers about a space uh, 50,000 square miles smaller than Texas. It's all the Tanana Chiefs region is huge and it's, and it's just an awesome place. But as we move forward as the chairman of STAC, I'm just honored to be here welcoming you and all and I especially want to just thank the department for hosting today. I want to give a special shout out to Stacy Ekvi for leading the creation of the HHS Hall of Tribal Nations. Stacy, stand up and get a hand, will you? <laughs> From me to you, Anabasi. And we'll get more into that more a little bit later, but first I want to recognize the importance of STAC. The stack, stack started in 2010 as part of the department's efforts to improve services, outreach, consultation with tribal nations. While there are many advisory committees across the department, few offer the ability of the tribal leaders to meet with leaders across the department on such a high level. Over the years, stack importance has not only strengthened and now the department conducts one stack meeting every year in Indian country. And these meetings out in Indian country are very important and demonstrate the department's commitment of really truly trying to learn how to better uh, partner with the tribes. The stack has been successful and has seen other departments create their own stack. And this is one of the greatest achievements I think of stack is watching other departments see the success what HHS stack has been able to achieve and said we need one too and they started creating it and so I'm just really thankful for that. It really shows a commitment on HHS is to Indian country and how effective federal programs could be working in partnership with tribes and that partnership is essential and we're as we go through talk about some of the successes over the past year it was that partnership that made it work. You, now it's time to turn to some questions and just talk a little bit more about the achievements of advanced appropriation. Advanced appropriations for Indian Health Service is a huge achievement that would not have been won without the successful partnership with the Biden administration and advocacy from tribal nations and tribal agencies. Because of advanced appropriation, the IHS has relative budget certainty as the year Congress continues to struggle with passing an appropriate appropriations package. Joining me today to, go to discuss the successes, I'd like to ask Rosalind So, Director of Indian Health Service, to come up, please. Please welcome her. Also welcome Liz Carr, Tribal Advisory to the Director of Office Management and Budget.
And then, and lastly, uh, I am joined by Stacy Bolin, Chief Executive Officer of the National Indian Health Board. Well, everybody took their seat. So let's just get right to questions. And we only have a certain amount of time. And I really want to not only talk about the successes, but there's still a lot to do. And so as we go through this, I'll just ask you a few questions. If you want to expand, I might also have some follow-up questions for you, all right? So with that, I'd start with Director So. You have a long career within the Indian Health Services. Can you briefly speak on how you've seen appropriations for the Indian Health Services evolve over the years? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So absolutely, I was thinking about this over the weekend in terms of the work that uh, I've seen as a, as a career employee and the challenges that, that we have had, um, and actually just the, this last go around with uh, shutdowns and just how traumatic that is to not just the people that we serve, but the people that work to do that work, and the, just the uncertainty. And for us to kind of sit back and watch it as it sort of was like a bad movie playing all over again, uh, we were able to get beyond all of that and really focus on the work. So on day one, we were, uh, day one of the uh, new fiscal year, we were able to focus on patient care. And that is our job and that our, that's our responsibility. So it was such a difference, um, a, a game changer, I would say. And also what is yet to come with mandatory funding, um, this is something that I think we have to continue to fight for. But the immediate thing was just, again, um, far less stress. We did better communication with our tribes. We did better communications with our staff just to the impacts of, or, or the, less, uh, the, the lack of uh, negative impact to our staff. And it, it was just, again, our ability to focus on direct patient care versus, uh, you know, my next paycheck and those kinds of things that, that we normally have to, we normally see in these kinds of settings. Thank you. Stacy. as CEO of the National Indian Health Board, an organization that advocates for tribes, across the nation. Can you speak to how you've seen advocacy for advanced appropriation develop over the years? What were the key factors in this effort that you think helped push Congress to pass it? Miigwech. Um, just wanted to quickly say, uh, Indigenous Cosmicanic Quay, my native name is Turtle Woman, and I'm a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. It's great to be here. Thank you, Miigwech, for that. Uh, everything that can ever be done starts with an idea. The idea for this that we know of came from a policy analyst named Karen Funk, who at the time was at the law firm Hobstra, Dean and Walker. But it didn't take long for the village of Benilik in Alaska to really start pushing this and showing the wisdom of this and talking about the stories of what happens in Alaska when the government shuts down and how if a river freezes while the government shutdown's happening and you cannot get your heating fuel up the river to keep your, um, your clinic operational, how long will it take? before that can ever happen again? And what would the incredible costs be that are for other things that would have to be put into getting that fuel up the river when the government finally decides to, um, when Congress finally decides to do the uh, appropriation? So it started with that. And Minilik partnered with the National Indian Health Board and supported us to lead these efforts. And it took 10 years to get this to happen. One of the things we always say at NHB when we're doing advocacy is, it's not our job to make it easy for Congress to say no. It's our job to ask. And if you don't ask, the answer's already no. So we asked, and we pushed and pushed and pushed. We were relentless. Um, the National Congress of American Indians, the National Council on Urban Indian Health, Seattle Indian Health Board, we had a coalition of organizations that stood steadfastly together, arm in arm, pushing and pushing and pushing. And then, at the end, what pushed us over, I believe, is the support of the president. And I know that uh, Shalanda Young at the Office of Management and Budget was a tireless advocate for this victory. And uh, the Secretary of HHS 
made calls daily for the tribes. So I think that's about the quick, the quick of it. Okay, thank you. Liz, you have a unique perspective in that you've seen the advanced appropriation advocacy from the department's perspective, from the IHS perspective, and now the administration's. What insights can you share about what, what made this advocacy successful at, the, at each of these levels? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Victor. Um, I think the biggest thing is that um, we can all attest it was a long time coming, right? Ten years is, is a long time, but it's actually quite short in D.C. Um, I, will, I always say that it's, it's really frustrating um, to just take these baby steps, but a baby step is better than no steps, and we did that throughout those ten years basically garnering a coalition of the willing to be able to push us forward and push us forward. So it started with the tribal leaders advocating and, and really sharing the impact of the federal government shutdowns on, on the patients, on the people in the community, but also on the providers at IHS, right? They have to continue working regardless of whether or not the government's open and what does that mean for them and their families um, as they try to provide services but don't have the certainty of a paycheck. That causes retention issues with, with our providers as well. And so being able to paint that picture and tell that story on the Hill to keep people kind of gathering, gathering the, making the coalition of the willing bigger, if you will. And finally, as Stacy mentioned, uh, bold request and bold action. And that's what the president did in his budget request. Um, we we're finally able to get a large enough uh, political will to push us over the finish line. And, and it was really incredible last year, right before the Christmas holiday, um, to get that included in the omnibus. And, and this year, as we're going through our appropriations negotiations, knowing that um, Indian Health Service will, will continue to provide this critical life-saving services in our communities um, is really rewarding. Um, but as, as Rosalind mentioned and Stacy mentioned, we know we have more work to do. Um, and, ag and again, small steps, baby steps are better than no steps, and that's what we con will continue to do um, as an administration, uh, as Native peoples, and as folks who really care about doing what the right thing is. So thank you. Thank you. Director Sill, now that we have advanced pro appropriations, how is it going so far? especially in the recent months with the threat of shutdown looming large across the agency. Has budget certainty impacted organizations um, at IHS? Thank you again, great question. So a number of things that we continue to do at IHS, one of the things that we, we set from the beginning uh, for this new fiscal year was to ensure that every tribe, every tribal contractor, every urban program get their money in a timely manner. Within the first 10 days of the, of the date that we got the funds, we've got about 90% of those dollars out to, to the tribes and to the urban programs. That is unheard of, you know, and so we want to make sure that, again, we set ourselves up for success because we knew, uh, our team knew that we were, there, there, uh, there were a lot of eyes on us to make sure that we can accomplish this task, that we can carry through on this, this amount of money and this, this kind of authority. So that was the first thing that we did, was to really set ourselves up uh, for success by establishing expectations and goals. And then we, would, we tracked them every single day. I wanted to know how many tribes were paid, how many tribes were paid. Because again, at the end of the day, we've got to make sure not only did we get the money, but that the money gets out there and flowing to Indian country for patient care. And so that was probably the biggest change, was setting ourselves up for, to be accountable, and to make sure that we do what it is that we're supposed to do with these resources. Because we know at the end of the day that if there are no monies, then patient care doesn't, doesn't get provided. And then what does that mean? That leads to many, many other things that, that just compound the challenges that we have in Indian country. So we were not gonna be part of that, and I'm glad to report that every tribe that was eligible for payment has been paid uh, within a reasonable amount of time, but 90% were paid within the first 10 days of those, those resources being received. Thank you. Liz, in your role at OMB, how has advanced appropriation for IHS impacted other appropriation areas serving in Indian, Indian country? Does it make your job easier, more difficult? So I think that's a, a little bit of a tough question because it, it depends, right? Um, getting something like advanced appropriations across the finish line required a ton of work. Um, and so it proved that hard things can be done in DC, which I know a lot of times people don't believe to be true. 
Um, that being said, though, uh, sometimes folks rest on their laurels and they think that that's, you know, they did the big thing and they don't want to move on to the next big thing. But we also know in Indian country, we have a lot of big things to tackle, a lot of issues to take on. And so um, my goal is to use this victory as fuel to uh, continually point to as a best practice in terms of us, the federal government, honoring our trust responsibility to Indian nations. Um, so it can be used as an example of something the government did because it's the right thing to do and can lead us to doing more of the right thing to do. So though taking that next step forward beyond advanced appropriations, not just at the Indian Health Service, but across the federal government. Thank you. Stacy. with the budget formulation process for FY25 going on right now, what type of information is most valuable for the advocacy push next year? Are, the, are there stories, data points, or other information that would be helpful in your advocacy efforts? Absolutely, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna backtrack just a little bit to where we are at this very moment. At this very moment, Congress is working on a deal that could lead to a 1% sequestration across the board, including the Indian Health Service. And in anything that we do, there must never be any sequestration of the Indian Health Service, any withholding of the limited funds the Indian Health Service already has. So in forming the next budget, I think that the best path forward is to the full engagement and work of tribal leadership and the people that you have hired to support you. Um, telling our story in an accurate way, telling our story repeatedly, being fearless with the stories that we have to tell and what the tribes are facing is the path forward. And in a parlance of sovereignty, diplomatic relationships between tribal governments and the government of the United States of America, that truth needs to be told to power, to the dominant culture in a very uh, clear way. The National Indian Health Board facilitates the process for the tribes, with the tribes, and sharing your stories with us would be extremely helpful. We can put those forward into action and help articulate uh, the needs of the tribes in a profound way. Thank you. So I guess the big question is what's next? So Director So, so what is next for the FY 2025 budget request and how do travel recommendations play into your agency's final budget request? Thank you. So, you know, as we have been advocating over the years for we, we with the Indian Health Service and tribes and the urban programs and all of our partners for advanced appropriation, excuse me, mandatory funding uh, needs to be there. We cannot go back uh, from where we are today, there is no way that we can go back to uh, less than what we had before. That's just a given. We have to continue to fight for what we have. And, and to have that assurance is, is something that we need to nail down uh, for, for, the Indian Health, uh, for the Indian Health Service. And then again, continue our conversations about uh, mandatory funding, what that means for us, how it's going to impact the lives of the people that we serve. That really has to be that message of where, what we are doing and how we're going to make sure that patients continue to be the priority for, for Indian country. And that can only be done through uh, advanced appropriations. If not that, then we, but we want mandatory, or excuse me, we want mandatory funding as we move forward. Yes, thank you. Liz, same question, how does administration ensure tribal recommendations are concretely reflected in the 25 budget request? So I think one of the important um, things to mention is that last year during the Tribal Nations Summit, the uh, president signed a presidential memorandum around tribal consultation that really creates some consistency across all of the federal agencies. In addition to that, OMB is now consulting, um, which is a new um, and exciting time for OMB. Uh, I will admittedly say that we haven't completely ironed out all of the kinks with our consultation process, but we're working really hard. And to that end, um, we did hold a consultation uh, right before we went into internal deliberations around the FY 2025 budget process. And I did that intentionally so that our director and our um, program associate directors, the folks who, are, um, le who lead each of the divisions within OMB, 
uh, heard less from tribes about what tribal priorities are. And so as we take on these internal conversations, I can attest that uh, you all were heard. The tribal leaders' concerns continue to be mentioned as we continue to discuss how we're going to propose uh, the FY 2025 uh, president's budget um, and continuously getting questions about what does that mean from Indian, for Indian country from folks who are not so familiar. And so um, again, we take consultation very seriously at OMB, um, so much so that my role was created through consultation. Um, and so now there's a voice there at OMB to be able to kind of bounce ideas back and forth as we continue with our internal deliberations around budget. Um, that being said, I also want to mention that um, as the tribal uh, advisor at OMB, my door is always open for tribal leaders to reach out to um, beyond IHS issues as well. And so um, just really excited that this administration has taken on uh, that leadership role in enhancing consultation, but also living up to what we hear in consultation by proposing bold actions such as advanced appropriations and mandatory budget for IHS. Thank you, and we're very glad you're at OMB. As we go in, Stacy. Um, Director Zoe just brought up mandatory appropriation, so let's go into that a little bit. While advanced appropriation was a huge success, we know that it's not the end. How does, how does that success of advanced appropriation, appropriation affect advocacy for mandatory appropriations? What do we need to do to accomplish that? We need to be bold. We need to stay up on the hill and work with the administration, work with our uh, partners at the Indian Health Service to make sure that we have the data that we need, that we have, we have the um, rationales that we need and so forth. And I know that is offensive in many ways because this is the trust obligation. This isn't a favor to us. This is what we've already paid for. This belongs to us. Please. So, did you want me to nope, stop? Nope, nope, you go. <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry, it, I stopped you. It can be done. It can be done. No, but, but the, the, the thing is this. I mean, look at the statistics that came out from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in August last year. Our life expectancy has dropped almost seven years. Some of our people will not live to be eligible for Medicare or Medicaid or Social Security. How is that a safety net for our people? There's an emergency happening in Indian country. It was spurned on by the triple threat of COVID because we had all of the uh, vulnerabilities that were built in, they were baked in from not funding the Indian Health Service appropriately, from not um, giving the kind of support that we already paid for in advance with our land, our lives, our cultures, and everything else. And, you know, we have a fentanyl crisis. We have all, we have a, the, the worst uh, maternal mortality numbers in the country. That's not okay. We need to make sure mandatory appropriations happens. We need to not be afraid to let Congress own their no and turn that no into a yes. And it's going to take every one of us all the time pushing, led by tribal leaders. Thank you. You're so, Director So, Liz, anything you want to add? I, I would just say one of the priorities that I came in with um, in, in my role as the director are, is to, one, is to ensure safe and quality care to every patient that we provide. And it's not just a term. It's how do we evaluate that? How do we know that we're meeting that goal? And the second one is to ensure that we protect the relationships that we have with our tribes, our tribal leaders, and our, our urban organizations, and all of our organizations. And to that, we can't do this work without a true partnership. We can't do uh, what, we, what we have been able to accomplish in the past year without that. And so I, I lean into that. I have uh, traveled throughout Indian country. I think I've been to Alaska four times, by the way, uh, and, and, to, and to the other um, areas that I have. And that has just been an absolute um, incredible experience to sit side by side with tribal leaders in their tribal lands to better understand what the issues are. Because we can all talk about it and read about it. It's very different to understand and appreciate the distances that our patients have to travel or the services that are not provided for whatever reason. Um, 
and therefore the patient loses all the time in that particular scenario. So that has been, I think, as I move forward in uh, and, and keeping those two priorities in front of us at the Indian Health Service, we will continue to make positive changes for the people we serve. Liz? Yeah, just quickly to echo Stacy's um, comments, I, I probably won't deliver them as strongly, um, but I agree with you. Um, you know, I think the advanced appropriations was, was the baby step, right? Uh, mandatory appropriations is the next step. Um, and it's going to take the same amount of uh, advocacy, if not more, uh, to get across the finish line, which means we need to continue to build that coalition of the willing. Uh, you have a willing partner with uh, Shalanda Young, our director at OMB. You have a willing partner with the president, um, as he proposed it in his president's budget two years in a row now. Um, and I think, you know, as we continue to push forward and, and try to get to that, to a more certain budget, a budget that allows us to increase to get us closer to fully funding um, the Indian Health Service over a, 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 a span of 10 years, um, really puts us in a good place to protect the health and well-being of our, our communities. And so I, I want to extend a, a, a great deal of gratitude to the tribal leaders for one, bringing this up as an issue, and two, continuing to push not only the administration, but Congress to, to do the right thing and, and make sure that we're honoring our trust responsibilities um, to the best of our ability. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Well, we still have a few minutes left and I'm gonna try to take up every minute we have. <laughs> so, I think it's important. We talked a little bit about the successes, you know, both appropriations. Uh, we didn't really touch on it, but we had the uh, Indian Child Welfare Act, that was also, we are very successful at, and that's great news out there. But they're still today, and we gotta get through the now. And so let's talk a little bit about 2024 and where we're at and what we need to do. So Stacy, would you like to start there with the budget? Sure. Um, I mentioned just, very, and thank you for that, I mentioned very briefly, you know, there's action going on on Capitol Hill right now. We, I see lots of tribal leaders here. Our, our people are going up to the Hill this week to talk to appropriators about what happens next. The message is clear. We cannot have any cuts to the Indian Health Service. The Indian Health Service is sacred way, one of the ways that the trust obligation to our people is met. No cuts to the Indian Health Service. So if you have time while you're here, that would be a, a, a very useful endeavor. Also, uh, the permanency of Indian Health Service and the permanency of the Special Diabetes Program for Indians, I'll say we, we were very successful together with, with the tribes and our partners in getting Congress to agree to increase uh, in the, Indi in the Special Diabetes Program for Indians. In this environment, that's almost impossible. And while I am happy for that, I wouldn't say I'm grateful. I would say, let's go get it. Let's make it permanent. Our people, you know, I was talking earlier with uh, folks from IHS about amputation versus preventative care. Um, we need to make sure that we keep the, the most drastic measures that harm our people away from us to the greatest degree possible. We also need to remember that the federal trust obligation for our people's health extends to every branch of the federal government, every agency of the federal government. So we need to hold CDC's feet to the fire as well and make sure that investment is being made in public health infrastructure for our people. Okay. Anything to add, Director So? Yes, thank you. Uh, there are, we have enormous amount of uh, challenges out there in Indian country. Uh, every day we hear them, whether it's transportation, whether it's fentanyl, whether it's uh, lack of referrals or lack of paid referrals, there are so many that are out there that, that I just has to continue to focus on. But how do we do that? How do we do that better? And I think Stacy just talked about that. Is that, in my case, working across HHS to make sure that my colleagues fully understand our role, our responsibility to Indian health or Indian country. And how do we do that? How do we make sure that all of the resources that could go to Indian country are going to Indian country? How do we continue to streamline grants? How do we continue to, to make sure that resources can flow and should flow to Indian country 
in a much easier way than it is at times. I've heard as I travel through Indian country where tribe leaders are telling me they're returning the funds because they just cannot meet the responsibilities, the expectations, and the requirements that have been put out in grants. You know, how, how sad is that, that there are monies that could do that? So I think there's still work to do just even within HHS. And I will say, I have um, been extremely fortunate to be able to meet with the secretary, with the deputy secretary. I've traveled with the deputy secretary and just letting them know in any country that we've got to do a better job. So I will continue to do that in year two. I will make sure that we are getting out there and because again, it's one thing to read about what happens in Indian country. It's a whole nother thing to, re to, 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 see it, um, to see it in person. But at the same time, it's not just all bad things. There are some beautiful, uh, just remarkable things that tribes have taken on using their own resources, making their own choices, and, 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 and that is self-determination. So it's been absolutely rewarding. As, at the same time, it's challenging. But I can then take those stories and tell a tribe, look, talk to this other tribe because they figured it out. Or here are some additional um, resources for you to be able to find solutions. And I think that's what we need to do better. We continue to need to break down these walls that have been built up over the years. I've even worked very closely with uh, Department of Interior. We've talked to the VA now where you know I need some help with the VA I need that agreement to get over the finish line here and I let's talk to Department of Transportation what can we do with them to bring over resources for our patient uh, for to address patient transportation so there are still many opportunities for for us to lean into one of the other things that we have done um, in the past the past year is we're up on the hill as well. We're educating our, our colleagues up there. We're letting them know, look, we're here. And I don't know how many times I've been told, I've never had Indian Health Service come talk to me. And so we, there's an opportunity there to be able to message, to be able to explain what is it that we can do. And every, in almost every single case, they say, what can we do to help you? So I think we have to lean into these opportunities. And so as doing that, I'm really excited about what we're, what we're going to experience in the year, the year to come to really look at how we make sure that we make a difference at Indian Health, not just today, but five years from now, 10 years from now, we need to change the, we need to change the Indian health care system today to be better tomorrow. Thank you, Liz. And just really quickly, I wanna mention something about what Stacy had mentioned and then follow up on something that the director had mentioned. Um, FY 2024, that's our most urgent situation at this point in time, um, given the uh, amount of tension that's there uh, on the Hill. Um, but I can attest that OMB is, is deeply involved in that process and is engaging um, nearly every single day, probably every single hour, to be completely honest, on how we make sure that we're protecting the resources that go out to Indian country. And so um, we're doing our very best and, and applaud uh, folks like NIHB and NCAI for doing the advocacy work on the Hill. Um, it goes a long way. We're hearing the same types of messages back from the staff. And so it's really helpful to be able to, to double down and say this is what the administration believes as well. Um, and then on the, on the piece that Rosalind had mentioned, I think it's really important that we show the successes in Indian country. So we do, the tribes do, fantastic work with just a little bit of resources. What would we be able to do if we were fully funded? So how do we paint that picture for people on the Hill, for people in the administration who may not understand what it's like out in Indian country? Um, I think that's a critical piece that's missing right now and, and something that I'm working on at OMB to be able to, to capitalize on and say, look at this program that did these incredible things. They accomplished all of these wonderful uh, outcomes and, and saved however many lives with $20 million. You know, I think that's a, it's a big testament to the, the innovation, the creativity, and the commitment of our tribal leadership, as well as the folks that, that actually work in our communities. And so I just wanted to end with that. I think it's one of the, one of the big pieces that we can do a much better job of as a federal government is, is really leaning in and um, acknowledging uh, the successes and the amount of innovation that's happening on the ground um, that's led by indigenous people. So thank you. Thank you. Before we get ready to close, I just want to say a couple words here. The, success, the successes that happen, happen because we all work collaboratively together. 
from the tribes to the agencies to departments to administration, all of us working together. Some might have to work a little bit harder than others at points and times, but it's the collective voice that gains the success. So as we continue forward, the importance here is that we all have to work together and continue to work together for the success of Indian country. With that being said, can you give our panelists a big hand and say thank you? Thank you. Passi. So once again, thank you, everyone. Now I'll turn it back over to Jess. Jess? Thanks, Chair Joseph. Um, what a terrific conversation. Um, I also want to just thank, again, our three panelists. Um, I know that I'm inspired, uh, and, and I just have to say it is um, inspiring to have these three uh, women leaders at the helm who are pushing aggressively on our behalf. Um, you know, it, it takes a village, but uh, it's important that those who are on the front lines are uh, just extraordinary public servants and, uh, you know, in it for the right reasons and, and, and pushing and, and being aggressive on this front. So thank you all. Um, I think that was such a, a great conversation and I think it's just, um, it spotlights how important advance appropriations are. Uh, I know that we have been made major breakthroughs uh, in this administration. Um, having this trial period, having this two-year period um, to experiment with what does it look like to have advanced appropriations, but goes without saying that um, uh, now that we have it, it needs to be here to stay, and so we have to keep pushing. So, uh, so thank you all. Also, uh, really appreciate um, Stacey and Liz talked about the power of storytelling, and we're hearing this a lot in our work, which is that you know, uh, numbers only tell part of the story, but when we uh, can really talk about lived experiences and how um, these advanced appropriations can help real people uh, in their health care, um, I think it really paints a picture for the people who control the purse strings uh, to, to make this permanent. I remember last year being in a tribal consultation uh, where somebody said something to me that is just stuck with me, which is uh, one of our tribal leaders said, you know, there is a mantra in Indian country that you should not get sick at the latter part of the year. Um, and uh, and it, it was, it's so true because we can't be in a scenario where we run out of money at the end of the year and we don't actually have a funding backup plan. Uh, that's inexcusable. And um, again, so inspired by the people that are on the front lines uh, doing this day in and day out, um, holding us uh, accountable, pushing us further, and pushing um, Congress further as well. Um, all right, we're going to turn to our second panel now, which is uh, uh, hopefully uh, also going to be a lively discussion. Um, and this panel is going to focus on um, the partnership that HHS has had with tribes to strengthen protections for Native families and cultures in 2023. Um, I want to welcome up to the stage uh, uh, the Hummel Indian Village Chairwoman, Erica Pinto, who is going to lead us uh, in moderating the conversation. Chairwoman Pinto. Um, I also want to bring to the stage White House uh, Domestic Policy Council, uh, Liz, Liz Reese, uh, who is here with us today. We have ANA Acting Deputy Commissioner, uh, Michelle Sauve. Uh, who has also been uh, a very uh, important part of our IEA team. And we have uh, Northern Arapaho Tribe Council, Councilman Lee Spoonhunter as well. So these are our panelists today. Thanks for being with us. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Chairwoman Pinto to, to guide this conversation. Thank you very much. I'm the chairwoman for the Hamul Indian Village down in San Diego, and it's such an honor to be here amongst a panel of distinguished tribal people for our community, and I have some questions that we're gonna start and just jump right into it. How's that sound? Uh, the three topics we're gonna talk about is uh, native language revitalization, Indian Child Welfare Act, and then looking forward, what's next? So. Let's start off with native language. And this will be with um, Michelle Sauvé. Michelle is the acting deputy commissioner for 
ANA, Administration for Native Americans. So the first question, Michelle, may I call you Michelle? Absolutely. Ms. Sove, Commissioner? Absolutely, yes. Okay, Michelle, last year, the White House Council on Native American Affairs uh, Education Committee released a draft framework on a draft 10-year national plan on native language revitalization. Briefly, can you describe to us what's in the draft plan? Um, I will attempt to be brief, yes. So there are four pillars uh, to this 10-year plan, and it really centers around four, again, key areas. The first is awareness, and raising awareness, obviously, not just to Indian country, but to the public at large, uh, to Congress and, and to governors, to everybody about you know, the importance of native languages, what they bring to community, um, how they serve as a protective factor for culture, and what we as a nation stand to lose if we lose even one more of these precious, precious you know, cultural resources. Mm -hmm. And the second pillar is recognition. Um, I, it, I'm a bit of a split personality here, right, because I am a tribal member, but I am also a, a federal employee. So the recognition part is the United States government owning its role in the decimation of native languages through the laws and policies that have been passed and enacted and enforced. And so that is the pillar of recognition and understanding and owning that um, and, and really needing to atone for that, honestly. Um, and then the third pillar is integration. Um, you know, it's not enough to have a half hour of language lessons once a week in a classroom. There has to be native languages woven throughout all parts of the community. So integration is about taking it out of the classroom into the community, it, available in every facet of life. That's the third pillar of integration in this draft framework. And the fourth is support. And, you know, we just had an amazing panel talking about the resources necessary for healthcare, right? But there are also resources necessary to bring back and revitalize, reclaim our native languages, you know, to the state that they were before all of these devastating federal policies existed. So in a nutshell, that's the 10-year that's the plan, focusing on those four pillars. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Councilman Spoon Hunter. How, this is a two-part question, okay. How does the Northern Arapaho tribe, Arapaho tribe work to revitalize Arapaho language? And the second part of that question is, how does the work being done on the 10-year national plan impact the tribe? Thank you for that question. We are a tribe, Northern Arapaho, in uh, Wyoming, which is about 10,600 people. And about two decades ago, we had about 250 speakers, and now, Today, uh, we are less than 75 speakers out of 10,600. And so we are working with our, our school system in making sure that the language is in from K to 12. Also, we work with our colleges, the community colleges and university in Wyoming to make sure, to ensure that our rep language could be counted as, as the language requirement for their degrees. And we have immersion programs. Uh, we, were, we modeled them after the, the uh, islanders in, in Hawaii so that from infant to four years old, our, our children are taught at school, preschool in, in our language, a rapa language only. And we, and we didn't stop, we didn't think then, but we had to start a program for, for, uh, uh, for the parents because our children were coming home and they were getting frustrated with their parents because they were talking all nothing but Arapaho language and their parents didn't understand what they were saying. And so it was frustrating to them. So we had to build that, build that in. And also we have a master apprentice programs right now where we have fluent speakers working with, uh, with, the, with apprentices that haven't been able to speak our language at all. And so they're learning directly. And, and, and so we're revitalizing, trying to save uh, what what language we have left because our elders always told us that once the language is gone who are you? you, you you're not a Rappo anymore and so we, we have to continue to work every single day uh, to learn language. Us as tribal leaders we, we take classes also to uh, every, every week to make sure that we're learning our, our language 
And uh, on the 10 year plan, uh, I applaud the administration for, for doing this for us. You know, it's, it's been a long time coming and I hope it's not too late. And I say that because uh, as, as you see many more tribes losing fluent speakers, you know, it's a race against time. And I, I, I applaud the administration. We, we uh, look forward to working with ANA Commissioner Patrice Kanush on the, on the feeling, um, the Durban Feeling uh, Act survey, and also on the plan needs to identify, not take a cookie cutter approach with tribes, and also to make sure that they meet the unique needs of every single tribe, because every language is different, and every culture is different, and so we got to instill in that plan to make sure that it identifies that and that there's adequate funding in, in that plan. Thank you. Well done, thank you. Moving along to Liz. Can I call you Liz, or would you prefer Ms. Reese? Oh, Liz is fine. Okay, Liz, um, thank you for being here. How is the administration working to ensure an all-of-government approach to revitalizing native language? I have a second question, but I'll stop there and let you answer that. Sure. Of course. So first, Navi Toa Hawi Mpovi, Navi Americana Hawi Elizabeth Reese, Na Nambe Wenge Wehang Amu. So introducing myself in my native language, Tewa, um, which uh, it is, you know, always such a, a pleasure um, and, and feels some right for me to do. Because, in you know, in knowing and recognizing the importance of our language, um, I feel every time I get to do that, particularly to start off, you know, remarks to folks that I'm, you know, grounding myself in who I am and where I come from. And I'm so grateful that, that, that I am, am able to do that. Um, so in, in terms of championing an all of government approach, I think one of the really uh, incredible things uh, about this administration and really the commitment that President Biden has made to uh, Indian country is that there are just so many more native affairs staff across the federal government than there have been in any prior administrations period. And, and I think what that means and what it means for someone, you know, like me who, who works at the White House, um, but is sort of constantly on the phone with different uh, Native Affairs staff across different agencies is that there's just so many more people who get it and who are looking for ways that, you know, their little piece of the federal government can, you know, jump in and help when it comes to a wide variety of different issues. And, and that's really, it's really game changing. Um, I think, you know, very long gone are the days when, you know, basically all the Indian stuff was at the Bureau of Indian Affairs and, you know, no one outside of it was really paying attention except, you know, the Indian Health Service, right? Um, and one of the things in this particular initiative um, that, that sort of fits so well is that there's so many different ways that different parts of the federal government can contribute to the revitalization of native languages and also just the normalization of native languages. Um, one of my favorite uh, stories that, that sort of helps me think about this is some of the federal agencies who were just like, what can we do to make sure more of our forms are translated into native languages uh, for the communities that we most often serve? Or like, what can we do to change the signs or the, you know, the terminals that people go and interact with whenever you're filling out a government something or other, right? Uh, these are all different opportunities for native languages to be integrated into a variety of aspects of what the federal government does. And not only is, is that you know, another place where native language languages are being, you know, preserved and, and normalized, but also I always think about there's someone that they're also hiring, right, who has to help do that translating work, you know, creating jobs, creating uh, work for some of these, you know, speakers that, that we have left who, um, you know, really need to have time and, and focus and, and funding to, to keep doing this vital work. And I think you know, in all of these, you know, tiny cumulative but very important ways, we are excited to be doing this work. Great, thank you. So how is this 10-year uh, national plan impacting the tribes? So uh, I, as, as, Michelle, as Michelle described, I think one of the things that we are really committed to doing 
uh, when it comes to this 10-year plan. You know, as, as a, she, she mentioned, sort of the, the core pillars were released last year. And, uh, you know, we are, I think, working extraordinarily hard to make sure that, uh, you know, the plan as it, it is, and when it fully comes out is done uh, right, you know, well and right, and that it really addresses all of the, the, the needs and, and concerns, um, because these are things that are so precious. And so one thing that I absolutely can promise is that, uh, you know, this thing will be, it will go through so much tribal consultation, you know, just as, as, as is, you know, fitting with something like this where, you know, the voices of the tribal communities who, who will be impacted the most by this 10-year plan are, are fully integrated into what is eventually put forward. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned precious. So let's move on to the next topic, Indian Child Welfare Act, and talk about our precious kids. Okay, the first question's for you, okay? For years, tribes have been following court challenges in the Indian Child Welfare Act, and this summer, the Supreme Court upheld the law. Although the outcome was in favor of the tribes, can you speak to how the administration would have responded um, can you speak to how the administration would have responded if it was not in favor? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure I can fully answer that question because I think that the, you know, I think everyone is very well aware uh, that the full ripple of that decision could have been, or the full ripple effects of that decision could have been, um, you know, nothing short of devastating for, for large parts of, of Indian country, you know, the, the law itself and then the potential ripple effects that were on the table. Uh, that have to do with other really foundational parts of, of, of federal Indian law. Um, so, you know, I was certainly, you know, I will remember forever where I was when I read that decision and then the deep sigh of relief that I was, I was able to, to let out knowing that the, the court had, you know, ruled, ruled in favor of, of protecting the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, what I can say about uh, that decision is that you know we were absolutely doing everything that we could uh, to to prepare um, for you know whatever outcome there would be, and one thing that was very clear um, in the eyes of of myself and um, some of the other uh, senior political appointees across the administration who who do the most of this work is that uh, there was a huge amount of work that we needed to do no matter what the decision was going to be. That this would be a period of time that because of this court case, uh, the world was going to pay attention to the issues that uh, the Indian Tribal, or that the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed to address. Um, and that because of that, um, we needed to, to show up and, and to say that we were also care, you know, that we continue to care about these issues that you know the law standing, uh, you know, not being stricken down was not enough. That there was, you know, we recognized that there was more we could do and therefore should do um, to, you know, address some of the core challenges and um, engage in some of the core protections that the that the Indian Child Welfare Act is all about. Thank you. So we're prepared for the next time. No, there, what next time? <laughs> okay, okay, good. <laughs> Don't I jinx hope not a next okay. time. Yeah, thank <laughs> yeah. you. Uh, moving to uh, Council Spoonhunter. Can you speak about the importance of ICWA to your tribe? Yes, yes I can. ICWA helps us protect our children, and it helps us provide a better future for our children and for our families. Uh, in, in Wyoming, uh, we were fortunate prior to the Supreme Court ruling to pass a Wyoming Indian Child Welfare uh, similar act that, to the federal level and to ensure that Wyoming would would help us with our with our children being 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 brought back to to our families, and studies have shown that our children excel and <clears throat> and achieve more in their own communities and with their people, and it's just it's it's, it's more important more than ever now now that we have this ruling that we continue to work and educate. A lot of people within counties, states, that the Indian Child Welfare Act. What is it about? Why is it in place? And why why should we honor it? Those those, those are the factors that we need to continue to move forward on. Because, again, you know, uh, 
when will there be a time that is challenged again? And that Indian children, um, you know, we were all biting our nails trying to feel how the Supreme Court would rule one way or the other. But it's important for us, again, we're working in our region, uh, Region 8 there with the tribes there. Uh, a lot of some, unfortunately, some of the tribes in, in our region don't have the good working relationship that we do with the state of Wyoming. So we took it upon ourselves to have a regional meeting and to show those other states come on board. You know, it, it, it's beneficial for everybody to work together, your counties, your states, the tribal people working with uh, the, the courts, working with the tribe courts. It's a win-win for these children and for their future and together we, we can, we can pave a way for, for the future of this country. Thank you very much. It, and it seems like tribes are continuously having to educate people no matter where you are, what region you are, what tribe you are. So I, I appreciate that. Michelle, Commissioner Sove, uh, can you speak to the coordination that the Administration of Children and Families with, does with the Bureau of Indian Affairs in implementing ICWA? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so one, I want to I want to acknowledge um, the the stack. Um, I know several members are here, and, and um, Council Member Spoon Hunters on the on the stack. But um, when our previous uh, uh, previous Assistant Secretary January Contreras came in, and she came to her stack meeting, uh, the stack challenged her on on Indian Child Welfare and how it was currently being implemented and the challenges that tribes had in working with the states. And so she committed to doing a series of regional engagements and listening sessions, kind of to break down those barriers and, and share some, to listen uh, to tribes in those regions, to hear some best practices and success stories. Because again, you can hear about, you know, and, and listen a lot and learn from what's not working well, but you can learn just as much um, when you're listening to tribes and states that have had successful relationships. So these series of engagements happened um, and it was really important. Um, so I, I want to, you know, thank ACF for listening to the stack, doing, doing those listening sessions and engagements because there was a lot to learn from and build on. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs attended those sessions as well. So it was a learning opportunity for them as well. And I think it, it strengthened our relationship and ability to do this work together. Um, it, but in addition, what uh, I think another success is, is kind of re-engaging on a previously signed memorandum of understanding between um, HHS, Department of Interior, and the Department of Justice, because you know the enforcement in, of ICWA is kind of like a three-legged stool, right? You have ACF that provides the majority of funding to the states and, and to some tribes. You have BIA that has the ICWA guidelines, but then if they're not being followed, DOJ, right, for enforcing. So uh, that's, that is a work group that is going on. There have been joint tribal consultation sessions mm -hmm. um, that have just uh, finished in November, and that is all meant to, to strengthen partnerships uh, and develop policies and initiatives that can further strengthen uh, the implementation of ICWA. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're down to the last couple of questions. And this is about the future. So let's start with Liz. Liz, what do you foresee the priorities of the administration being that um, being next year for protecting and revitalizing native tradition? Yeah. Oh, this is this is also this is a hard one because also we're you know coming up next next week is our um, uh, annual White House Tribal Nations Summit. So I feel like. See you there. A lot of the, um, the 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 big promises and announcements, you know, are are all sort of scheduled to be to be next next week, and I, you know, kind of can't scoop myself or or the or the president or anyone else and and on that that front. Um, we won't tell anybody. <laughs> um, but uh, what I will say is that I I think that I'll I'll say what excites me, I guess, about about the work to come. Um, and and that is 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 actually uh, you know I, I think you know Joe Biden as a president is um, someone who is very committed to 
doing the harder and important work. Um, I, I, you know, I, he's not someone who likes, you know, quick, easy, and empty wins. He likes tackling, you know, the 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 big and and the hard stuff. Um, even knowing that a lot of the payoff will be, uh, you know, many decades uh, down the road in a lot of instances. Um, you know, I think that's true of the the work that we've done on climate change. Um, you know, in particular, and um, it's also, I think very true of a lot of the most important work that needs to get done in native affairs policy you know writ large you know it's, it's about reckoning with a lot of our um, more challenging histories uh, it's about you know committing to these more long-term uh, processes to you know reverse those past harms and you know build a you know a brighter and, and better and and more accepting you know future for everyone including um, tribal nations and, and native communities. And, you know, I am excited to, you know, work for a president who understands that um, and is and is willing to to really do that, you know, hard, long term kind of work, because I, you know, I think we all know that that is what is going to be required to really confront some of uh, these issues and, you know, protect these things that are the most precious to us. Excellent answer. Thank you. Commissioner Sauvé, what efforts is ACF and ANA engaged with that can help strengthen Native families? Uh, well, one thing um, I think our, our, our um, Commissioner Kunish would like to, to share is the uh, ANA recently announced a Native Early Childhood Initiative. And I think it, it goes along with some of the things that Council Member Spoonhunter mentioned is, you know, when you start teaching languages um, to the little ones, um, it kind of involve, it, it can, in, in the best way possible, um, can then begin to involve the whole family and, and learning the language as a family and, and, and bringing that, you know, back to life for the community. You know, you can, you're, you're doing professional development with the teacher so that they can teach the languages and bring and helping and those little ones want to go and talk you know to their elders and to others in the community so this native early childhood initiative um, is really about recognizing the return on investment that early childhood brings you know not just to the the lifespan of the child that attends that high quality early childhood program but also to the family and the community as well and so in throughout 2024 we're going to be highlighting the kind of the best of those native early childhood programs that are funded not only by ana but in other parts of acf as well so look for that um, in 2024. outstanding i think that when we start early with our youth it builds pride, especially knowing where they come from, where we all come from, and then growing up and taking that into school and into your adulthood, I think that builds, um, that protects us from doing, you know, going down the wrong path. So instilling that pride early, getting the language out quickly, um, so we're able to absorb it. My mom, who's watching right now, hi mom, she uh, spoke, she, she, this is how they talk in San Diego, we spoke Indian, we spoke Indian growing up. That's all they spoke and that's all she spoke until I don't know, second grade, but um, as she got older, you know, she, she didn't speak that because there's no one to speak it with, but she can understand it. So we have a handful of uh, native speakers in our communities. Thank you for the answer. Councilman, Councilman Spoonhunter, this is the final question. You're in the hot seat. Uh, are there areas that impact the native family unit that you would like to see more from HHS? Yes, that, that's, that's a very good question. First, let's take what HHS has, the little funding that they give to tribes now, and let's get a commitment from HHS to go self-governance and allow tribes to develop self-governance. Let's, let's take, let's, we know in Indian country the needs of our people, the services, let us reevaluate, redesign programs, give, give us the funding and give us, allow us to exercise our tribal sovereignty and to develop these programs for our people. And, and you, you see successful models now. You see in IHS, 
in tribal transportation. We've taken those dollars and we've done phenomenal things with them. Mm -hmm. And we're accountable, we're credible, we're resilient, and we're ready to get to work. So let's get HHS to, to commit to self-governance. Mm -hmm. Aho on that. <laughs> uh, well, this brings us to the end of our panel. Any closing, are we at time? We've got about five more minutes. Any closing remarks that any of you wants to make? Anything we didn't ask or we should have touched upon? Starting with Liz. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, that's, oh, these open-ended questions are the hardest. Um, I, I think that um, one of the most challenging but important things about this area of policy is just how interconnected it is with other policy areas that, um, you know, it's really hard to take, you know, language culture or sort of families and, and, and separate it from the other aspects of, um, of our lives. Um, and I think that is both um, an opportunity, but I think it's also a challenge uh, because I think any particular work that we do is only a small piece of a very big puzzle um, that all needs to be addressed in order for these things to really stick and, and sink in. Um, and, and also that, uh, you know, one of the, you know, mistakes we are at, at risk of, of making in the opposite direction is trying to do too much everywhere and then not enough focus. Um, and so I think striking that balance is 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 important and 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 hard and part of why we need so many uh, you know great minds and um, people committed to this work both you know within the federal government and then of course in in Indian country and, and amongst the different organizations that that do really important work to help um, convene everyone and provide policy advice et cetera um, because uh, you know it's it's really that that balance of you know, forest and trees and, and, and everything together that, that I think we really need to, to make a dent in these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Stovey. <laughs> um, I agree with everything that Liz just said, and, and I would just add um, that it is, it is great that there are so many others out there across the federal government um, that want to get involved in and really support Native policy. And I would just say that I'm also really grateful um, for the voices of tribal leaders who, who keep coming back to the table and, and raising these issues um, you know, to us and to the leadership um, because you know, it's your voices in this that matter the most. And the more you keep raising the importance of language and families and cultures and traditions, then the more the leadership is going to want to, to do something and respond to it. So um, we have had a great participation in the tribal consultations and the listening sessions around native languages and probably through the sacred sites and in other areas that, that the government has reached out to. Um, so I just want to uh, express extreme gratitude for, for in having your voices heard in this because it's extremely important. Thank you. Councilman Spoonhunter. Yes, I just want to thank uh, my co-panelists here for their, their comments uh, they just made. Um, I look around at, at the flags in here, and I know there are a lot of not, flags not represented here, Native American Heritage Month and, and this event that's going to happen at the White House for the tribal leaders next week. And let's just don't do this on occasion. Let's, let's put Indian country first and foremost. Let's challenge the administration to for the, the first people that were here. We were the first people here, and I always say this, but we are the most regulated, regulated people in every way possible. Put us first and foremost, and there's a lot of work and a lot of things that we need the government to help the tribes and Indian country that we need to repair, fix, and also create. So let's, let's continue to work together, but let's don't just stop at certain occasions. Let, let's continue this work every single day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, distinguished panel. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Happy Native American Heritage Month, you all. Thank you very much.
All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Chairwoman Pinto, thank you for moderating. Um, I also love knowing that your mother is back at home watching on the live stream. Uh, that's terrific. Um, two really great conversations. Uh, thanks again for th those three panelists. Uh, Councilman Smoot Hunter, um, so important to hear what we're doing uh, at the tribal level, uh, at pushing us to do our work better. Um, again, this is a, 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 a multi-pronged effort uh, to make sure that these, these programs are moving forward and it helps to get reinforcement and pushes uh, uh, from our tribal uh, partners. Um, Acting Deputy Commissioner Sobe, um, thank you too for your work um, on the policy level. Uh, and I just wanna echo your sentiments about our stack and how important um, this body has been to us in terms of, again, pushing us pushing the secretary directly on uh, where we can make improvements and where the gaps are. And lastly, Liz Reese, I can't see any of you and where you ended up sitting. Okay, Liz, uh, it's really just wonderful and gratifying to hear um, the talent that is in the White House uh, and that, that has the ear of, of the president um, when we do this work. And so um, I'm inspired by all of you and appreciate you joining us for this conversation today. Um, now on to uh, the very exciting part of our program. Um, we are now um, going to turn our attention uh, to our Native, Native American Heritage Month celebration, which is the dedication of our new HHS Hall of Tribal Nations. Um, so I want to invite up to our, the stage um, the Secretary's Deputy Chief of Staff, Angela Ramirez, uh, to join us for some remarks. Angela. Good afternoon. Uh, let me just first say what an honor it is to be here, and both to our friends in the room and folks watching on live stream. I love the reference to friends and family at home. I guarantee you my dad, who is a tribal elder out in California, is probably watching this, recording this, and will probably be sending this to the entire entirety of the West Coast. So hello to our folks uh, in the room and beyond. Uh, it is with great excitement and passion that uh, I am here before you today. I know you and the people that come before you, your ancestors, all of those on the shoulders of which we stand, have poured so much into this land, into this day, into the very fabric of this building and what the Department of Health and Human Services represents. And we are so proud on behalf of the Secretary to celebrate Native American Heritage Month with you. And I say celebrate because we have a lot to celebrate. In 2023, we did something monumental. And I know we all know this, but it's worth taking a pause and saying it out loud. We implemented advanced appropriations for the Indian Health Service. No more doing our best with budgets and seeing how it goes. No more going to Congress hat in hands. This year, we shielded the Indian Health Service from budgetary uncertainties, ensuring that our tribal brothers and sisters get the care that they need, no matter what. And in September, Secretary Becerra signed the new HHS tribal consultation policy face-to-face -face with tribal leaders in Indian country. This isn't just talk, it's action. We're fortifying the nation-to-nation -nation relationships with our tribes, opening up new avenues to cooperate, and building up the health and well-being of our tribal communities. This hall of tribal nations isn't just a display. It is a testament, a testament to our shared commitment. The flags of these tribal nations on these walls represent the heart and soul of the Secretary's Tribal Advisory Committee, a gold standard set by HHS, the very first department to establish a secretarial level tribal advisory committee back in 2010. Of course, HHS recently held a stack meeting in South Dakota this past December, and senior leaders from across the department had the opportunity to see a wide range of services provided and also where HHS still needs to do more. And we heard directly from you 
We heard directly from tribal leaders about the experiences of their communities. The entire trip, the whole outing, was a call to action. From visits to Wounded Knee Memorial, to conversations with members of local tribes, we are reminded of our duty to the health and well-being of all of these communities. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're opening 13 new healthcare facilities, adding two new tribes into the IHS Tribal Self-Governance Program, investing in the tribal workforce through IHS, HRSA, and beyond. Effectively joining with you, we're investing in the future and the future of our Native communities. I can't let this time pass without giving a special thank you to Stacy Ekafi, who led in the creation of this incredible hall. Stacy has been over for over 15 years with our Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs, leading our engagement with tribes, making sure we work hand in hand and that we're held accountable. And it is her tireless efforts that led to the creation of STAC and now to this Hall of Tribal Nations. So I really genuinely want to say thank you to Stacy, but also thank you to all the members of STAC for the service of the communities. It is an honor that your nations and your work are represented here. I also want to thank the over 10,000 HHS employees who are rooted in Native American ancestry. You are the backbone, the unsung heroes that ensure that over 2.5 million American Indian and Alaskan Natives get the consistent care they deserve. And while, of course, today is indeed a time for celebration, it's also a time for action. And I love the, the pointing earlier. It's up to all of us with the action. At HHS, we'll continue to partner with you, with tribal governments, with health programs, and with allies to provide the critical services in Indian country and to prove the health of Native Americans across this nation. So thank you again for being here. Thank you to those watching. Thank you for all that you've done and all that I know you'll continue to do. And happy Native American Heritage Month. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jess. Thank you, Angela. All right, I now want to uh, welcome to the stage for a special blessing um, of our new Hall of Tribal Nations, Dr. Raymond Loretto, Councilman with the Jemez Pueblo, and by Lance Fisher and Giovanna Gross of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe, Ogallala Lakota Nation, and North Peru. Please join us up on the stage. Good afternoon to all the tribal leaders that are here today. I'd like to first of all begin by also thanking uh, Stacy Coffey and her staff that created this work here this month to make sure that we come here for our celebration to honor our flags. The representatives from the Secretary Tribal Advisory Committee that had their flags over here today. We're gonna to be, be thinking about, about it today in a way to, to bless the ones that are here. But I also wanna make sure that we keep in mind the 574 federal recognized tribes, the flags that are out there that fly proudly and they stand strong to support the people that they represent. As tribal leaders, it's really hard to, to encompass and to do all the stuff that tribal leaders are asked to do and think about. Not only do we think about the health of our people, we have to think about our education, our infrastructure, 
and all the things that go with it. So I want to give thanks to our to our leaders that are here today, and also to also not only be here but to celebrate, you know, Native American uh, Heritage Month celebration. But as tribal leaders, we are always working year round, every day, helping our people out. But we celebrate the life of our people each and every day. We ask the Creator to help us, to bless us. So with that in mind, first of all, I want to thank uh, Cheryl for doing the opening prayers for us. He puts us in balance today while we're here, here today. And I also want to thank all the speakers that gave some really good comments. These are the everyday work and struggles that we endure. So with that, uh, I'd like to, to not only do a blessing in my total language, but I also want to make sure that we think about the other flags that are not here today. Like I said, they're, they're, they're flying out there proudly. And so with that, let me begin my prayers in my total language. <clears throat> I want to give you a tone to a shade yet. The Wolo Quimale, the Honicumata, a lot to your Majuna Quato, Gungata, a lot quibble more in my colors, you know, the Vacala Lina, a lot tape, I get a lot petty at toy, or lot um or tongue, quill eight, I got a lot of poco wagi, poco quack, a quibbonu. Hey, on the gay, shook we a quack, a hook with a gay with Payanu. All the white babbly quons lake on a massacre where Quacala Lina Uta. Olo tell you, Monjuna, what a low ho ye came or ele quack a moin pay. Doka quicala lina, a loquay, a quam molokia. The battery ho ye came a limo pay like quicala shall nay water. O wash a tongue, or low bullo or quam of pay and a dabble a tongue and a wig, you know. Olo dabble a ho ye for a quiet joy knocking out, hit dinner. He knows the way, and he knows the linear, no picket, or quad the me so. O dabo lo tiano hu to lo qua si tonge le de si gue no che na ti anche saggio o lo matte che o lo qui o qua si pia o lo te o qua pe la no pe che to qua gue ho de na de qui o io si tonge to se de e lo te dabo ta o lo o lo ho io fu giù e quando si na e qua ho mu e che te na o wen a o di na qua no pe che to qua gue qui qui mi so ne te le dabo ta i o po i se ne po lo se ta lo qui pe si mi e le Thank you. Piven Sotobost, Lance Fisher, Nahashebe, Mahayana Nakaratsusbe, Natsista. Good afternoon, my name is Lance Fisher from the Northern Cheyenne Tribe of Montana. I uh, just wanted to provide a Cheyenne flag song. Um, Giovanna just arrived, so I'm going to try to. <laughs> prolong my uh, introduction, but I just wanted to explain a little bit about the song. This song um, it was composed by my relative Conrad Fisher, and the song, it, it's composed specifically for women veterans, and just wanted to, this is also, um, we also celebrate Veterans Day in November, so I'm always happy to sing both Cheyenne and Cheyenne veteran songs, uh, but the song just talks about women warriors, the flag, the one you've got to protect, there it is, still waving. Hamata Kippi, Tante Westia, and a Pichu Sapixto, a Giovanna Gross Hemacha B, Ogla Lakota, not proving Hemacha. And so I said, Hello, my relatives. I shake your hand with a good heart. Uh, my name is Giovanna Gross. I am Ogla Lakota and more than proven.
Shimon, Aho, thank you very much. I want to thank you both uh, for such beautiful song and blessings. Um, I know we at HHS will continue to strive every day to uphold our nation-to-nation -nation relationship uh, and our partnership with all of you. Um, I appreciated uh, Councilman uh, Spoonhunter's words that we uh, strive to do this every day, not just once a month. Uh, or one month a year, uh, and appreciate Chairman Loretto's words also um, that we continue to do this work on behalf of 574 recognized tribes, not just the flags that are held, uh, hung today in our great hall. But what a really uh, fantastic day and celebration. Um, this is uh, not only our HHS Great Hall, but from here on out will be our HHS Hall of Tribal Nations, uh, which is something that I think we can all be proud of. So. Um, again, thank you for being with us today. I would be remiss if I did not mention that we have soft drinks and water and cake at the back of the room, two kinds. Um, so please treat yourself before you leave. Um, this is going to conclude our events, but uh, before we wrap up, I actually think we have one more uh, song for you today. So I'm gonna bring uh, Lance and Giovanna back up to the stage uh, to close out our ceremony. Thank you both for being here. I thought I, thought I heard Ron chatting encore, so thank you, Ron. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shahu.
produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.